Okay. My clock in Norway says it's uh, four o'clock and we are going to continue with one more speech for today's conference day. It's a great, great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Tricia Logan with us today. She is joining from Canada, which is nine hours back. So when it comes to the topic, it would have even fit a little bit better tomorrow, but it's not possible to ask her to get up at three o'clock in the night. So now already it's quite early in her country. So Tricia, welcome very much. Thank you for being here with us um, to an our Central Europe time. You are going to talk about the issue with which has quite been highlighted in newspapers also in Europe over the last couple of months. As many of us know, there have been found many hundreds of bodies of children who had been in boarding schools and you have investigated, is, is the wrong word, but you have worked with the topic of, um, how, can I, how can I say it, settler colonial genocide in many, many years. And this is just the top of the iceberg, which you have seen and known. And um, I'm sure your speech is going to be very tough, but very important. And I'm looking very much forward to listening to you. Just want to say a few words about you before you start talking. Uh, everyone can also find it on our webpage. You are an assistant professor at the UBC School of Information and a faculty, faculty research associate at the Indian Residential School History and Dialogue Center. You are a med schooler with more than 20 years of experience working with indigenous communities in Canada. And you have had roles at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the Metis Center at the National Aboriginal Health Organization, Healing Foundation, and the Legacy of Hope Foundation. Um, as far as I can see, there might be some similarities to our talk tomorrow, the last talk tomorrow about the Sami minority. But now we are very interested in hearing your talk and the floor is yours. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and Good evening to everyone. Um, it is a little early here in Vancouver, but uh, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for your uh, for sticking around for the end of the the day. I'm going to share my screen and share some slides here. I say that like I haven't been doing that every day, and every time I do it, it takes me a minute. So yes, thank you so much, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, my name is Tricia Logan, and I work here at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And I've spent the last, oh, um, I, th I think I started in 2000 working with the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, which was um, uh, an organization created in Canada to address the, the healing needs of survivors of residential school, but also to intergenerational trauma. Um, and at that time, a lot of that work was still very new. It was, it was a kind of a government, um, government organization that would fund community-based healing projects. So it, was, it would um, facilitate research and um, try to build capacity within individual Métis, First Nations, and Inuit communities in order that communities could create healing programs based on their own um, traditions, their own kind of social, political, economic realities. And yeah, that, so that, at that time, it was still early on. And I've, I guess I've worked through being an oral historian and someone who works with traditional knowledge keepers and uh, through that have built histories of the residential schools by, by having heard hundreds of um, stories, oral histories, stories and testimonies from residential school survivors and people who form, went to the residential schools. So I'm going to um, just say hi Chika and thank you. I'm speaking to everyone today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam. The Hunkamedium speaking Musqueam people welcome us here to Vancouver. I'm not originally from Vancouver, and so I've been welcomed very warmly here to this territory. And I want to acknowledge the Musqueam for um, 
for the, the space and the, the support they give to UBC, especially how much those teachings and that support is tied to knowledge and tied to the land of where we work. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the area on the traditional lands where I originate from, which is Kekobeka Falls, Ontario, um, which is near Thunder Bay on the shores of Lake Superior in the Robinson Superior Treaty area. And that's where I grew up in Anishinaabe territory as a Métis person learning from kind of prairie and Northwestern Ontario, for the very middle, the very center of Canada, the very cold part of Canada. <laughs> So it's 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 new for me to be out here in BC on the on the Pacific coast with rain and warm weather is very strange for me. <laughs> but these are the teachings that I received and the teachings that I grew up with that shaped obviously shaped a lot of how I learn and how kind of in a university sense by kind of epistemological um, process was informed a lot by living in Winnipeg and living in that part of Canada. And I want to also acknowledge uh, survivors that, again, over the last 20 or more years, uh, it's been part of my role, part of my job, and part of my studies, and part of my work directly with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities uh, to listen to survivors, to record oral histories, to uh, attend group gatherings, to sit one-on-one -on -one, um, with health healthcare providers, and um, and learn of what the truths, and this is part of what the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada heard as well on mass. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada operated between 2009 and 2015, and released their final report in 2015. So we're often what's called we're often in what's called a, a post TRC or post reconciliation era. I think that's what some people are calling it because after the report is released, it's it's responding to kind of the rest of Canada and kind of so civil society saying, you know, originally saying 10, 20, or even five years ago, we had no idea this happened. This was a hidden part or unspoken history of Canada. We didn't know this happened. We had no idea uh, that's what happened at residential schools. And we've now reached a part in Canada where um, people can't say that or can't <laughs> um, accurately say that anymore. And it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough part of the kind of public narrative to grapple with because um, for indigenous communities, for First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities, uh, that's something they've lived with their whole lives. It's been ever present in community and national histories for them. And so this is the stories I share I, and the, the knowledge that I've accumulated over this time and this is this is representing stories hundreds hundreds if not thousands in that presented to the truth and reconciliation commission um, of former students survivors who attended residential schools and boarding schools um, in canada and also honoring um, as catherine was introducing the the topic the children who didn't return home um, there has always been within the communities, within Indigenous communities, there's always been knowledge of um, the number of children that died at residential school. And there was always knowledge of where they were buried, even though it was often in unmarked spaces. And it was last summer where in Tecumloops to Shequetmuk and near the Kamloops Residential School here in British Columbia, not far from where I am in Vancouver, um, the community initiated research on the the former site of the residential school using ground penetrating radar and identified 215 um, burials that were unmarked right next to the residential school. And this, after that, followed uh, a number of other communities across Canada doing very similar ground penetrating radar research into those unmarked graves and mass graves. And this is work that continues today and, and had happened years before, but really that um, this kind of critical mass of, of, of starting investigations into the sites that people always knew about. So there's a lot that we're learning about. Um, even today, that's, it's a lot of work and a lot of uh, history that's still coming up. <laughs> 
And so it's kind of an acknowledgement also of that this is part of the process. This is part of um, healing and trauma that come up because you can imagine for communities that um, lived with those legacies of residential schools, and I'll kind of describe a little bit more what residential schools and boarding schools were. Um, but for people who experienced that trauma as children and then re-experienced it with their children of their own or with future generations, um, and then having gone through a truth-telling process of sharing stories, often a very painful process of sharing stories to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to filmmakers, to you know, to to group healing sessions, to to each other, to their families, and now it, with every new investigation into the sites, all of that trauma and all of those memories are, of course, understandably brought up again, and so it's it's kind of um, it's brought a new, not a new, I shouldn't say new, because that's the thing is people who attended those schools and people who lived in those communities always knew that under the apple orchard or next to the school or behind that fence, there were people buried there, but it's kind of met, it's meeting Western science, meeting the traditional knowledge and community and survivor knowledge with uh, Western methodologies of ground penetrating radar, archaeological investigations to learn more and so it's we're right now right today in this period of of just that learning more um and so I'll talk today a little bit about um I'll just kind of talk a little bit more about the schools and I say I, I introduce it and say you know Canada still there's Canadians and and the rest of Canada who says we had no, you know, I lived, I've had people say I lived in this town next to this residential school for 30 years, my whole life growing up, and I had no idea what went on in there. Um, and so now it's confronting those narratives and saying, um, you know, that these stories have always existed and, and also the response to it has always been there. There's always been Indigenous methodologies and Indigenous teachings and methods to facing healing and mass trauma or individual trauma um, and connecting. It's a lot of this is what's connecting kind of Western or sometimes church um, methods for healing and addressing trauma with traditional methods that, have, that indigenous people have always done uh, before kind of colonial settler colonial disruption. And uh, this is a photo from the Capel School. This is the school where my grandmother and great grandmother attended in Labret, Saskatchewan, um, in the very flat middle part of Canada as well. Uh, there was a very beautiful valley that my grandmother used to call paradise. So it's, it's a very beautiful um, lake valley in the middle of a very, very flat prairie land. <laughs> and um, that's one of the photos that my great grandmother is in. Um, and I think that's my own personal connection to these histories is that's obviously it's a, it's a history that my grandmother never talked about or very rarely talked about or for a long time was rarely talked about in my family so like a lot I think that's a I'm, I'm sure a very common um, reaction or it's a common thread throughout uh, discussions of intergenerational trauma is is not no, not only denial but it's kind of protecting family members, protecting yourself by not speaking about it and not acknowledging it all. Added layer onto that, of course, is um, the indoctrination and the racism and settler colonialism that, of course, indoctrinated um, generations, five, four or five generations in some families, um, because these schools were open for over 150 years between the late 1800s and the last school in Canada closed in 1996. And that's a terrible map. And I always preface that by saying, I need to find a better map. <laughs> um, but this is just a geographic representation of where all the schools were in Canada that they did really span um, every part of Canada, um, including the East Coast. Um, the map was based on schools that were represented legally through the Reconciliation Commission. And that process, the Truth and Reconciliation process, missed a bunch of schools, which, of course, in a longer talk and <laughs> in a more in-depth talk, uh, we talk about all of the survivors who were not acknowledged through Truth and Reconciliation because their schools 
legally didn't match um, a certain um, guidelines. Um, schools that were run by the Moravian Church and the International Grenfell Association were not included. These were mostly Catholic and Protestant, um, the Church of England, Anglican Church, United Church, Methodist Church, um, Protestant churches, and also the Baptist Church, uh, and also Catholic churches ran all of these schools between the late 1800s and again, the last one closing in 1996. And so the schools were created uh, for, in the interest of the state, in the interest of the state to remove indigenous presence from Canada. And so this is just kind of, I wanna kind of talk about what the trauma was, what this is, because it's individual trauma, it's um, high rates of abuse, physical and sexual abuse, high rates of student death and disease and negligence associated with these schools. Um, but it's also this kind of collective settler colonial experience of, of indigenous people, because there, of course, there's generations and there's people who did not attend the schools, but it's it's hard to say that they were unaffected by the schools existing, by forcibly removing language, forcibly removing culture, and forcibly removing children from their parents for over 150 years in in, in several generations. And they were formed under a, a model of Western European British boarding schools. And often that's, there's still a lot of this rhetoric where they're like, but this is, you're privileged to attend a boarding school. Um, schools that were created for, for poor children, for pauper children. Um, there are like through South Africa, um, including schools for Sami children um, in uh, South Africa, in Northern Siberia, in um, any places in Australia, New Zealand, uh, this idea of forcibly removing children from their families through schools and this very close connection also to child welfare, to forced adoptions, um, which is kind of goes hand in hand with uh, this project to civilize, Christianize and assimilate all indigenous children there was this idea in Canada to get rid of the Indian problem was to get rid of the Indians, that this, this cost to settling land claims and accessing resources and building a, a railway across Canada was very costly. And it would, you know, of course, in the minds of the government at, at the time, the late 1800s, early 1900s, removing, forcibly removing Indigenous children was, was the answer. Um, and of course, the schools were um, very severe, very, um, people have these, uh, when you listen to survivor stories, if you're, you're able to go through the Truth Reconciliation Commission or hear testimony from either group hearings or individual hearings of what happened, people tell a very vivid day of the first day of school uh, where all of your hair is cut off, all your clothes are taken away, all of your belongings are taken away and burned. You're given a number, you're given your, your name is taken away and you're given an English or French name instead. Um, and those very uh, traumatic, very stark, very, um, very uh, kind of that instant separation, kind of physical, mental separation from your family happens so, so rapidly and so brutally all at once. And then forced not to speak your language and not understanding what's happening. And that it's also a lot of people describe what's been described to me as this instant um, uh, betrayal that you feel that your parents, why have my parents sent me here? Children didn't understand that um, for many years of operation, attendance was mandatory and parents did not have a choice and had to send their kids. They were threatened with jail or threatened with kind of um, economic repercussions if they weren't, if they didn't send their kids. And so you have this instant thought in, in a child's mind that your parents have sent you here willingly and that they've abandoned you and that they, you know, that you, um, it creates that break. And then you return in the summer at the end of the school year back to your home, to your home where you don't understand the language anymore. And you're taught for your whole life that your, your parents and elders are superstitious, that you're taught about hell and you're taught about savagery and that your family is, are savages and that you're, um, you know, you've created this break. And so it's this intergenerational passing on of never being raised by your parents and also the likelihood that your parents also attended the schools. And so you're being raised by priests and nuns and members of clergy 
where the high rate of physical and sexual abuse also um, kind of compounds all of these language and cultural and social impacts. Um, and there's this, this irony, this is part of what I'm trying to, I'm learning a lot about uh, in this era of researching the mass graves and the actions of the churches, both the Catholic and Protestant churches and the government of Canada and these ironies of teaching church charity and church, um, you know, very Christian teachings of how to care for one another and how to care for the children, especially in those, you know, I think in any case, not just Indigenous and not just in Canada, but in any case of sexual abuse and abuse from the church, this is something that comes up quite often is childhood uh, trauma and that that disconnect of what teachings were meant to be. And so it's part of this bigger conversation as well about settler colonialism, because it's it's in a way for Canada and the, what makes this a kind of a, a Canadian or North American experience is, uh, or an indigenous experience, I'd, I should say, um, is compounding all of those. Because I think as a historian of residential schools, what I've tried to, um, express is that residential schools didn't stand alone. They weren't an isolated, because people often, the, the term genocide comes up quite often. And that was something that came up to me quite early on in the early 2000s, was people said, this was a genocide. What happened to me was a genocide. And so that's what I heard back from survivors. That's the vocabulary people use, the terms people use of having their name and their identity taken away. And then this, that the residential schools were interconnected with the child welfare system with forced adoptions and what was called at the time the 60s scoop where social workers provincial social workers could come into communities and remove children for relatively arbitrary reasons and take them away to non-indigenous families often very far away to the united states some went to australia um some went to new zealand uh, and the family and the band, the First Nations band, was never notified of where they went. People are still today being repatriated and reconnected with their family members that they were taken from in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And arguably, this is a system that carries on today because the rate, the, the high number of children taken into the child welfare system today is still disproportionate and also very traumatic. And there's a system of Indian hospitals and tuberculosis hospitals where to kind of curb the rate of tuberculosis, children were often taken um, in large numbers and taken to the hospitals, whether they really, some didn't need to be there and some did. Um, and that's that entire system of hospital, church-run hospitals was connected also to day schools. And this is also these impacts of colonialism come into gendered violence. And um, in Canada, what we call uh, there was a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and how all of these kind of interwoven systems of, of trauma and intergenerational impacts, how centuries of gendered violence now manifests itself in a high number and a tragic um, legacy of, of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And so all of these impacts of physical and sexual abuse uh, malnutrition, starvation, it was years of poverty and um, kind of economic pressure on Indigenous communities and, and no access to drinking water, which continues today. Um, and all of this kind of being interconnected systems that even if you didn't attend a residential school, um, there was all of these kind of connections. There was a, a motto, a, a kind of a, a tagline saying, through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada that said, for the child taken and the parent left behind. And I think that was an important, you know, it was just kind of a, almost like a motto, almost like a marketing uh, <laughs> on the bottom of all of their um, publications. And I think that's not emphasized enough. It's, it's for all of the children, what was happening to them in the schools kind of was happening at the same time what parents were dealing with forced relocations, land rights, um, prohibition uh, ceremonies and uh, languages pro pro prohibited, um, the, the, all these kind of legislative and policy decisions to control Indigenous lives were happening at the same time that the, all of the children were gone. 
And so the experiences of intergenerational trauma for indigenous communities um, in a way that they, they are very much connected to these multiple or interconnected uh, systems that had been happening for over a hundred years before the schools were there continue on today um, in that way of kind of multi-generation experiences um, and pre-existing in structures like the political, social, economic structures inside First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities were all being dismantled and destroyed by government and church all simultaneously. And so also the, the structures to create healing and to create wellness and to create, you know, indigenous knowledge around health and medicine um, was simultaneously destroyed as forcibly removing all of the children, which is what's talked about today, you know, these bigger conversations about structural violence, racism, discrimination, and how that is represented historically and how that's represented in kind of contemporary Canada. And a lot of this is connected is connected to, to land and water and all living beings. It's trying to look at healing and intergenerational trauma from an indigenous perspective, which is very much about holism. And which is, I, I understand is not necessarily unique um, to indigenous communities to kind of look at holistic, um, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical realms being connected, but it's also the added element of indigenous knowledge being connected inherently to the land, to the water and all living beings that what happens to humans is happening to all. And that's this, again, a bigger conversation about settler colonial genocide and what happens in Canada on forcible uh, removals, resource extraction, um, structural racism and um, how that dismantles it. And then it's now restoring healing to, um, to allow for kind of self-determination and healing and tying that to ceremony, to kinship, to reconnecting families who were through generations torn apart over and over through schools, foster care, um, incarceration, and tying that back to language and um, traditional healing processes. And so these ideas about holistic uh, perspectives, um, connecting mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Again, I, I'm sure that's not, it's not something that's necessarily unique to indigenous communities, but there is an indigenous understanding and indigenous interpretation of it, often through, through language and teachings that existed for hundreds of years since time immemorial, thousands of years really, um, inside of Canada before there was kind of colonial dismantling of all of those structures. Um, and it's, it's providing care and it's, because um, as much as I'm, I'm listening to survivors and listening to elders and listening to community members tell stories of what happened to them inside the schools, that has always been coupled with how people heal and how people respond to the trauma and how people have responded to those decades and generations of, of trauma and neglect and abuse and, um, and death. Um, and it's often a term we're, we're using in the term I was taught by um, our colleagues here at the Indian Residential School Survivor Society, which, which manages healing here in, in more than manages, it facilitates or it kind of is a healing um, center is about cultural agility because uh, for First Nations, like the diversity, the high level of diversity of different First Nations communities, languages and uh, nations across First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities across Canada is highly diverse. Um, some very urban, some very remote and rural um, with very different uh, languages, traditions, beliefs, and with different relationships with colonial histories. And so being culturally agile and being able to provide healing support in a way that is um, where Indigenous people are able to self-determine how they want their healing to, to be um, is trying to just create that space and, and acknowledging as well, there was, uh, there was backlash against the church. There's always been backlash against the church, a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of trauma, understandably. Um, 
but it's also acknowledging that a lot generations of survivors also were raised in the church and some turn to the church today for healing and for spiritual uh, support people that's the only way they've ever known how to pray and how to um, respond to trauma is using the church um, and some also again forcibly removed from their families and their traditions their whole lives were never taught about traditional healing and medicine so prefer kind of a western style of psych psychology psychiatry and therapy that's not necessarily attached to an indigenous and often it's a it's a combination often it's a combination of traditional learn relearning traditions as part of that healing as well and this is just this is just i kind of pulled different um notes i'm kind of my i'm mindful of the time um and i'll wrap up soon and take some time for questions but i wanted to talk a little bit about <clears throat> um intergenerational trauma and the response to it that is very and sometimes kind of a western western methodology western therapy methodology but some of it is very uh, specific to indigenous communities and often that's uh, pairing survivors with youth um, and having kind of multi-generation homes and multi-generation approaches, um, there's often a call now that's attached to reconciliation. And there's there's been healing movements throughout. That's this, this used to be, you know, in the in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and I think survivors were always coming home. This has always been led by children who came home from the schools even from the day they open from the there's correspondence from the early 1900s of kids coming home to tell their parents what happened to them in the schools um, and the parents reporting it to the RCMP the parents reporting it to the local priest and nothing being done nothing changed um, priests were maybe moved farther away farther west or farther north um, RCMP didn't respond or rarely responded um, and so it was all of that onus, all of the healing and all of the addressing intergenerational trauma was all placed on the survivors and their families. Um, many who didn't speak about it their whole lives. Very often I would sit to record uh, oral history with a survivor and they would sit down and say, I've never told my parents, I've never told my family, I've never told my spouse, I've never told my kids, but here's my story. Um, so there's a response now to to put a lot of this work also on the rest of Canada to say that Canada and the way Canada is today uh, has to face the treatment of, of Indigenous people in residential schools, but also these layers of trauma. And so it does require retraining uh, or training new social workers, nurses, doctors, and kind of Western-based health. It's this, there is this movement towards intersections between Western um, methodologies, Western uh, traditions in health and healing and wellness, uh, and trauma therapy, and matching or meeting that with Indigenous methodologies, or at least uh, coordinating it somehow that if someone was wanted uh, a, a connection to First Nations or Métis or Inuit healing and, or, or trauma response, that there was a way to at least connect them um, access, giving people access to that, those resources. Um, and elders have led the way. There's, there's a gen, there are generations of elders that didn't attend the residential schools who, who retained language and retained traditions and medicines and teachings and that are able to kind of facilitate this healing. This was, you know, it was also survivors coming into their homes, uh, sitting around kitchen tables, sitting around band offices and meeting rooms talking about what happened to them at residential school, sharing it with their friends and saying, it wasn't just me, it wasn't just what happened to me. And so healing movements kind of grew out of those, those first conversations of that physical sexual abuse and the, the treatment that I, the treatment that I experienced, I wasn't alone in that. And that, you know, all of these different iterations, and I think that's, um, when people are asked what healing means to them or what health and wellness means to them, as you can imagine, it's, it's thousands of, you know, it's individual responses. As individual as those traumas are, is as individual as how people address that healing. Um, and so some of it is, um, some of it's based, and I think it's, 
Um, it's not always a model that's used across Canada. This is a teaching that was from Anishinaabe teachings that kind of where I'm from in kind of around central Canada. There's teachings that are connected to what's called the medicine wheel, the four directions. And this is just one example, and it's not the only example, and it's not the only iteration. And I, I use it sparingly because I know there's a lot of different ways to interpret it. And there's a lot of sacred teachings, um, but it is something that comes up quite often um, in using circles as a, as a way of, this is a very traditional teaching that Indigenous people have always used, the four directions of East, South, West, and North. And the medicines connected to that, that you enter into, um, you enter into ceremony through the East. That's the, that's the sun rising, that's tobacco, that's the medicines of tobacco and um, sage and sweetgrass and a sage from the West and um, sweetgrass from the South and cedar to the North, having four sacred medicines and having those, those four, uh, you know, it, it's mostly talking a lot about balance and those four piece, parts of you, um, the emotional, the East, um, the spiritual, the South, the mental, um, the North and the physical, the West, um, creating balance, creating balance. And I'm sure again, that's not something that's entirely um, just Indigenous people or just, you know, it's, it's trying also not to homogenize Indigenous knowledge, but there are frequently, those are kind of models that are used to just talk about balance, to talk about Indigenous ways of knowing the world and providing healing that that relies on um, traditional teachings. And a lot of that's connected to um, experiential learning and, and kind of connecting back with language and culture and practices and all the different ways that that takes place. Um, and a lot of this relies also on language revitalization and cultural revitalization and reconnecting to uh, languages and cultures that you were forced away from. Um, and I think this is, this is one of my elders that taught language to me. This is my elder Grace and her granddaughter. And so I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here. I, I can see that we're, uh, I'll give some time for questions, but it's, I, I, I want to acknowledge the work of survivors that a lot of this work has been done by survivors, by elders, um, by healers, by traditional healers who've created space for truth where you know, for, for decades, for nearly a century in Canada, you were taught and you were told not to talk about this. Um, of course, if it was abuse that the church had perpetrated on you, you like any church abuse in any, um, in any country, um, that's part of this kind of forced secrecy and kind of absorbing that trauma as a child and told not to talk about it that it's secret, that it's a sin, that it's, um, you know, that you're pushing down these abuses and you're pushing down these abuses and, and reacting in a way um, to kind of these social, political, economic pressures on top of what, of the, that trauma that's just happened. But um, in Canada, well, well, Canadian history for a long time did not record these histories and did not record these traumas. Um, artists, visual artists, songwriters, poets, bead workers, um, embroidery, like people were creating art through trauma therapy. They were, they were sharing their trauma and, and in some ways, many talk about healing and art and healing and uh, reclaiming culture as, as all interconnected and interconnected with the land. For a lot of people also, the way they define healing is always inherently connected to land and territory and traditional territory. Even for people who live in urban centers, who were, who've lived in cities their whole life, who went to residential school or had experienced trauma and moved immediately to, a, to an urban center, reconnecting to ceremonies and teachings in different ways. Um, over the last two years, it's been over Zoom. <laughs> it's been over Zoom and through the pandemic. Um, but we, we really raise up our survivors and our elders for, for leading all of this work where, yeah, there's, um, there's a huge, uh, there's a huge growth of the number of indigenous people who now are in medical school, 
um, psychology uh, therapy programs or in roles or and that's part of the profession now and who've integrated these western and indigenous methodologies um, and we uh, we see a big change happening but a lot of this work was happening for decades by elders and survivors and this is this is an event i, I was at yesterday um, and there's a lot to, for that youth are doing as well because what's happened in not having this as part of canadian uh, curriculum or narratives for for decades it's now you're we're now com combating a new level of of hate speech and uh, denial saying either <laughs> it's a we're at a weird nexus where it's either denying that the residential schools happened at all or saying oh it's just you know they're they're boarding schools they're church schools the church had good things in mind um and somehow diminishing or or erasing what happened um but it's also there's also been a weaponization of residential schools there was through vaccine mandates or through racist propaganda on social media saying take all those indigenous people back to residential school weaponizing it in a way of you know kind of using hate speech and denial uh, together with racism so it's again asking people who've been uh, experiencing intergenerational trauma to to experience re-experience this reaction or this not a, it's not just a reaction it's a it's this ongoing hate and discrimination against indigenous people um, and youth, and I, you know, while I talk about survivors and elders, there's a role, there is a role that youth have played in uh, taking on anti-racism training, anti-violence training, holding kind of activism or just social engagement with not just Indigenous groups, but also all groups, especially in urban centers or in rural spaces too, where um, immigrant, migrant Canadians are also experiencing racism and discrimination and all kinds of human rights and social justice issues where they're taking on all of these conversations of teachings from residential schools, teachings from trauma, and sharing that with other non-Indigenous communities, with refugee, immigrant communities, people who have also experienced violence from all kinds of different countries and different experiences who've come to Canada later um, and created these kind of anti-racism and anti-discrimination movements, often led by youth, led by different Indigenous leaders and groups as well. And yes, I'll say thank you and I'll be mindful of the time here and leave a couple minutes for questions, but Marcy, thank you. I'll try to start sharing. Thank you very much, Trisha. I think this was one of the most touching cases we heard, I have heard in a long time. And of course, I was also touched, as surely many of our listeners, of your voice and your telling. It is a story and being able through you to understand what it, how personal it is, how hurtful it is, how harmful it is, and the great work you are doing. We have already the first uh, questions. Um, before we give the floor to her, I have, um, I have a question related to my comment and this is how how do you cope with it what is your what is your strategy to keep on doing this important work since 20 years you told you said yourself you have a personal part in this and it still of course will ever be very touching for you it's surely very demanding to work with this so what do you do to take care of yourself to to be able to do this work Good question. I'm sure for a number of years I didn't know how, <laughs> and it's probably been a um, learning. And it's it is to the best that I can um, learning from. I've learned all of these different um, in different um, communities. Learned from survivors. Learned from survivors, and learned from family members what what they do. Um, but it's I think it's also the the volume and the the number of of stories that there are. Um, personally, I've, I've gone through kind of language revitalization programs and kind of reconnected with language. And I think, um, that's one way to kind of, I think if mine is, you know, obviously throwing myself into other kinds of work, <laughs> um, but relying on, I, I think just relying on teachings and relying on. That, that's the thing is that's and I don't do it enough and I admit that I that's something I don't do well enough is 
I listen to stories from survivors and I listen to histories of residential schools, but I do not balance enough and I should do it more and talk about it more is um, in those teachings, there's always a way that the people talk about their life with trauma and how it passed on to their kids and that undeniable that it connects to my own family. But there's always a reflection on how they managed it or how they deal with it or how they respond to it or not respond to it that those teachings are there so it's it's trying to learn as much as I learn about the history I'm trying to learn from uh, how people heal thank you Trisha for this answer we have a comment here from Elise Marie Jurtfoss who is a Sami herself um, saying thank you very much you see it for your speech which was very thought-provoking and interesting we have a question here. Maria, can you give the floor, please, to um, the next question? And all of you, please write your questions in the QA or raise your hand. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Do you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Hello, Trisha. Thank you so much. This was extremely moving. Uh, I mean, I think that the 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 whole idea of my connecting to this uh, to this conference was just to listen to you. Actually, it was really very moving and very touching. Thank you so much. I have a question. Uh, how did you come up with making the research on 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 the whole on the whole idea? Was it uh, how much was it spoken in your family? I mean, uh, did did you talk a lot about it? Did you feel that you have your own personal blocks and traumas, and then you came up with it? And you all of a sudden understood that you just can't help doing it. How did you come up with 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 making this? This is the first part of question. The second part is, um, you have been talking about all kinds of methodologies here and approaches about uh, how we can heal this trauma. What do you think particularly about psychedelics uh, in this process? Because I have tried myself uh, in the Netherlands five years ago. It was extremely extremely. Um, like the most beautiful experience I have ever had. And I really believe in, 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 in the great power of, of, of all this. Uh, unfortunately, it's not very scientific based uh, uh, at the moment, uh, at least uh, in, 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 in the major part of the world. Although I know that in the United States, they already start doing some things on MDMA, on LSD and all some kind of all these kind of you know, research. So what do you think about that? So two parts of the questions. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I came to it. Um, the first project I worked on in 2000 was was among Métis people's experiences. And Métis people in Canada are, for anyone, um, if I, do, I don't think I introduced this uh, properly, but Métis people in Canada are um, uh, kind of communities, nations in Canada that were born from intermarriage between you know, 200 years ago when Europeans first came to Canada, they intermarried and had a lot of kids with First Nations women. Um, it was mostly European men. Um, and there were so many children from those unions that entire nations and entire languages were created through people who were, um, and now it's, now of course it's, a, it's an entirely, it's a nation onto themselves, Métis people. Um, but the government of Canada kind of dealt with Métis people very differently. And at the time, in early 2000, when there was healing programs created for people who went to residential school, um, the schools, a lot of people understood them as for only kind of like uh, full Indians. And that's how I knew. My, my family is Métis, um, grew up as Métis families for several generations. And I knew Métis people went. Um, it, that's kind of like a historical reason why they they did or didn't and I had professors at the time saying no these schools were only for for Indians for First Nations people they were not for Métis people they didn't attend and I knew for <laughs> I knew for a fact that my family attended and my grandmother attended as Métis people and so I knew that wasn't historically accurate for people to say they didn't attend um, and so that was part of my first job was working with a Métis organization to research how did Métis people attend? Um, in short, briefly, um, without going into the full history, this is a lot of my research is Métis people's experiences at the schools. Um, because the schools were kind of 
funded by the federal government of Canada, Métis people really weren't supposed to be there, but because they were often very nearby and a lot of people, they were often marginalized and living in lives next to or of what the government described as Indians um, and seen often as rebellious and were kind of dispossessed of their land, they ended up at the schools anyway, even though their, their attendance wasn't necessarily recorded or their attendance was often manipulated to kind of bump up the number of kids, like to increase the number of kids in a certain school, they would move Métis children around. So Métis children did attend, even though the government said, we don't, we're not paying for them. We're not, we're not financially responsible for them. They attended anyway. And that's how my, that's historically how my family was connected. But early on, I remember very naive me 20 years ago in 2000, I remember sitting with one of my aunties, my dad had five sisters and I have five wonderful aunties. Um, I sat with one of my aunties, I said, well, grandma went to residential school, she's fine. <laughs> As a naive younger person, of course, then my grandma, my aunts told me stories that that is actually not the case and my grandmother is actually not fine and told me why that is the case. And then kind of, then came me learning about my own family's trauma for the next 20 years. Um, for better or worse. And so, yes, and this was to the second part of your question. Um, huh, um, in Canada, that's, I think that's one of, it has become a stereotype, but it's also become a reality is for generations of survivors, the use of alcohol and drugs and addictions is, is interconnected. But now as it kind of turning to healing of therapy, um, I, I, I don't doubt that there are I think the, the different ways people address trauma and therapy. I think there is a relationship between um, between addictions or responding to addictions or not using or not using any sort of substances. Um, but in that way, there's also a ceremony. There's, there are ceremonies that people connect to uh, that might use um, Kind of alternative therapies or alternative medicinal um because the medicines people use like the traditional medicines tobacco sage sweetgrass and cedar are traditional but there of course there's countless other medicines that are have a lot of different purposes and it's it's firstly restoring the traditional knowledge attached to those medicines that people know where and what to find the medicines where to find the medicines and then how to use them and so yeah then in some ceremonies they are used i'm sure um, but it, it there inherently there is also a connection to um, misuse. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Yes. And I want to say hello to Lise Marie. I see Lise Marie. I've met Lise Marie before, and it's good to see her here. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Trisha. Thank you for the questions. I just asked if there are more questions, but I can't see anyone now. I think your talk was so rich, Trisha, and uh, I, I saw all these healing approaches, and I think there is very much to learn from the connection with the elderly, the connection with the youngsters, to, to, to give also the elderly the, the possibility to pass on and help in the or do the healing process, actually. And uh, I am going back to your slides quite often, I think, in the future, because they were very interesting and teachable so thank you very much for sharing it so broadly and putting all the different approaches for healing indigenous healing on the on the stage and not the western approach for healing which often is not appropriate or not goes far enough or, or approach the culture in the right way if my if i might say it like that um i can't see any more questions for now um as I said, it's surely because your speech was both very touching and very rich. So once again, thank you very much for taking the time and, and also going in with all you in your speech as you did. And uh, that's how the message really comes through even stronger. So thank you very much. Thank you. If I now round off this first day, as we are approaching the end of this first conference day, I would like to thank all the three speakers again. Uh, Thomas for his general introduction to uh, and not net, but also a little bit net intergenerational transfer, behavior transfer, stress transfer. To Maggie 
for going in depth in how psycholo psychologists address net and how museum employees or researchers, other professionals might use, work with it, with net and what to have in mind when we work with traumatic events in this way. And of course, to you, Trisha, for taking the time to show us this example of what is going on in Canada, which many people in Europe maybe not know. And you, as you said, unfortunately, not even in the closest neighborhood in Canada are aware of or pretending are aware of is happening uh, still and the healing process is going on as this has been a long process. Tomorrow, we are starting at 11 o'clock and the first uh, speech tomorrow morning will be um, following up the first two speeches from today and we are going to learn more about net and how net can be used to heal communities i will say to help communities with uh, different stories and traumas where parts of the communities do not communicate how net and net facts as uh, katie ropiant will tell us more about can help to to healing in societies and uh, the second talk from Paolo Fonda, which I also look very much forward to, is about the war and the mind war set. So what can, can we learn from people who are, what can we learn about the mind, how it is functioning in a war situation? And the last speech, which will be held in uh, Norwegian, is uh, about the Sami community and collective trauma in the Northern Sami areas which is transferred by surely misuse of power by the majority as also Trisha talked about and um, this is in relation to what you said uh, Trisha unfortunately or fortunately depends on which language one is best at it's a Norwegian so to all of you thank you very much for joining us today welcome to those of you who have the time to follow us tomorrow each speech will be recorded and made available on our web page and it's free to you to for you to share it to use it do whatever you want with it use the knowledge which you got from our speeches speakers today and we'll get uh, tomorrow because as you have heard there is a huge need to talk there's a huge need for others that we professionals whatever professionals we are listen that we are fellow human beings and that we contribute to somehow better societies by taking care of each other. So for now, take care of yourself tonight and uh, this evening or today, Trisha, for you who is in the beginning of the day. And uh, I hopefully see you tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Thank you very much. Bye.